you realize, Scott, that the person that invited you here is actually a Buckeye? <laughs> I don't think you knew that when you <laughs> prepared your presentation. And, and, and so Talk I was, about discrimination, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was curious, so in your Wolverine example, I mean, you didn't mention the risk of becoming a Wolverine if you were born in the state of Ohio, which would clearly be, you know, much lower than the risk if you were born in the state of Michigan, right? Um, but, you know, in that regard, when you're talking about genetic testing, and obviously there's all these other predictors, family history and, and environment, and, and when you communicate this information, you know, how valuable is it to put more and more things, more complexity into an algorithm that would actually perhaps increase the predictive value but make it more confusing at the same time? Yeah, I think there's certainly trade-offs, and I think what's been interesting is we see in some complex diseases, we see how uh, there are these, these complex algorithms uh, where, you know, the idea is you wouldn't necessarily want to try to explain every variable that was used. You would just want to give the take-home information. Sometimes it can be tailored in terms of the person's preferences. You do have some high information-seeking people who are going to be probing and might want that fuller detailed explanation versus, you know, the, the, we psychologists call this need for cognition. Uh, and so, but some people, it might, and so again, it, I think it speaks to the importance of, of knowing your audience so you can have that appropriate level of tailoring. However, in some situations, we just don't, we like, we know that in theory, it's a multifactorial condition, but we don't have a sophisticated enough risk model yet that really, and I think Alzheimer's is a case in point, we have some ways that we can include certain variables but we aren't yet to the point where quantitatively we can take all the potential factors, feed them into, you know, like you hear about this Framingham heart index of 47 point, and we don't have anything like that in Alzheimer's or a lot of other conditions. So there, it's more a matter of, of trying to be open about the caveats of what you're providing and say, because again, one thing I get frustrated with people, they say your risk is, as opposed to, you know, the risk for this demographic is, and you happen to be in this. So that kind of distinction is, I think, important to try to, to make, if you can, to people. Question from the audience. And I wonder um, if perhaps Dr. Fassbinder could answer to me what the risk would be of a student failing grand rounds if he doesn't ask a question <laughs> at the, uh, during the session today. <laughs> Howard? Um, Howard Hamrick from BMS Pross. Uh, Dr. Hess alluded to the fact that basically uh, in, the, in the arena of diagnoses, we're diagno people are living longer, the mortality is going down because we're diagnosing earlier. Uh, in the case of the genetic testing and some of these other profile testings, we're looking at prognosing the potential or the possibilities that a patient may acquire or uh, in some way gain a particular disability or disease. Uh, in the case of reenumeration, only after diagnosis are we reenumerated or is there a therapy established? So my question to the three of you basically is, if we pro do testing to prognose a potential possibility for a patient, since we really don't have therapies that would actually do work, and if you look at drug therapies, you know 50% don't even do anything, um, what's the value? I think I'm on here. Um, I actually have um, quite a bit of concerns about what Dr. Roberts was talking about in, in terms of predictive testing where the output will be recommendations like you should exercise more, you should lose weight, stop smoking, drink less. I mean, I think payers aren't real excited about that kind of thing because we know behaviorally, you know, there's not a lot of benefit. Um, I think that, uh, as I was alluding to earlier, I think each time that a payer is going to pay for something, they're going to want to see an, a, a significant improvement in health per dollar invested. And if they see that, they'll pay for it. Um, I don't think in the next decade they'll pay for 23andMe screens. Yes? You wanted all, all three people, right? Oh, okay. Yeah, along those lines, I think, uh, is you would give an example in the delivery of clinical care 
uh, I would agree with what Dr. Hess has said and then maybe extend it in terms of, you know, we just don't have a lot of data on the use of these diagnostic tests and treatment algorithms. So uh, right now if you do, you know, if you get this test and it reads positive for this specific disease, unless we have outcomes data in terms of, all right, if you have these specific criteria, patients who receive this therapy perform better, and there's less overall cost to the healthcare system, then that could be of benefit. You know, the challenge is, is that we don't have many treatment protocols that are followed you know, based off of even very basic clinical criteria. So that would be helpful. I think part of the other challenge from the healthcare standpoint is that diagnostics in general, the end result is more clinical care versus less clinical care. And that's where there has been a lot of pushback from the third party payer side, unless there can be a demonstrated ability of the diagnostic to result in less invasive care. So maybe earlier detection will then involve less invasive treatment, uh, then that could be, used as be, be viewed as beneficial. But uh, right now, a lot of these diagnostics are not being connected to clinical care outcomes. I think the more immediate applications will probably be more, even though I talked a lot about susceptibility testing, will be more around the pharmacogenomics angle. Uh, we know there's a lot of room for improvement given the rate of adverse events following, you know, because of side effects of medications. And so I think that's perhaps the one arena where we'll see the most immediate benefit that I think payers are willing to support. Uh, so to the extent that that applies to, to dentistry, I think perhaps that's where we might expect some of the first, first uh, utilizations. Yes, uh, please identify yourself. Hi, um, Saroj, I'm a D3. Um, I just had a question. Can you guys talk a little bit about the politics behind personalized medicine? And um, are there any major players? And how did the new healthcare bill address personalized medicine? Well, uh, one of the very, very important things that's going on right now uh, is the whole question of whether genes are patented. And the Supreme Court just heard a very important case, Prometheus versus Mayo Clinic, that was um, not directly related to gene patenting, but to the idea of patenting sort of biological processes and things. And interestingly, Myriad Genetics that does the testing for BRCA1 and BRCA2, um, they just had a, a case heard in the New York Court of Appeals that went to the su Supreme Court that basically supported gene testing. And interestingly, the Supreme Court on Monday vacated the case and sent it back to the, um, the appeals court and said, reconsider this in light of Prometheus. So I think we're probably going to see the uh, the courts move away from, um, in, instead of thinking that gene patents are a good thing that's promoting more research and all, and, and probably are going to lean the other way and, and recognize them more as barriers to patient care. I mean, there's a lot of aspects of politics, but I think one of the ones that we're very concerned about is when we start doing genome-wide sequencing, are we going to have to cut 500 different deals with each, you know, license holder or, or could paralyze us? Yeah, I would just add, um, many of you already may be aware of this, but, you know, the, the head of NIH, Francis Collins, is, you know, was a you know, main player in the Human Genome Project, so I think to the extent that uh, he's obviously a major player in research funding, and so presumably someone very sympathetic to, to the idea of personalized medicine. Also, there are uh, groups like the Personalized Medicine Coalition uh, that are involved with advocacy. Uh, and I think we're seeing a lot of interest from venture capital biotechnology, so I think they are also major players and they can influence politics through their advocacy efforts. So I think there's a lot of interest out there in terms of, uh, and some, you know, some, in my world in public health, sometimes people use this as an example of so-called gizmo idolatry. They feel like we're too enamored with the latest cutting edge technologies, but I think there's a lot of, of uh, fiscal resources from from industry that, that are really uh, invested in this, this idea of seeing personalized medicine promoted more heavily. So to the extent that I think that influences the politics, I think you can, can uh, we'll see some of those effects. Please identify yourself. Yes, Jim Simmer, uh, Department of Biological and Material Sciences. Uh, bad science can cascade. And in the enamel field, we had a gene, for instance, tuftolin, that we 
that was touted as an important player in enamel formation, and it was later found to be irrelevant and not even in enamel. And then a genetic study found uh, uh, polymorphism that just statistically seemed to correlate with dental caries, and, and it was only a few million bases away from the Tuftalin gene, and so that made a headline. And so now I can sort of picture this going to having a saliva test for checking on that polymorphism and then having somebody recommend that I get certain prophylactic treatment or something to prevent caries because I have that sequence variation. Uh, how much protection is there away from these things just cascading like that? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question as we look at you know, the, how readily available some of these tests can become. Uh, the good news is, is that in terms of the healthcare delivery, these diagnostic tests have to go through a very strict regimen you know, through the FDA, and then the, the testing laboratories also need to be CLIA certified in dentistry to actually perform these tests. So that type of information in terms of you know, decision making and patient, you know, discussions uh, really were at a distance, and you may know the cariology field better, Jim, in terms of what is out there in terms of those tests, but, you know, the, the issue that you might be speaking to is, okay, now these, you know, over-the-counter tests that ac actually basically go beneath all of the regulatory hurdles, which it was quite amazing to see how these tests are now readily available. I don't know what the impact is going to be to clinicians to say, okay, these patients have identified, I have all these polymorphisms, and what do I do about it? And I think at this stage, you know, the level of evidence and the validation of these tests, really, it really hasn't occurred, and I agree with you in terms of the quality of the science, and even this, if we use this example, the 23andMe, what they're terming is a high level of evidence probably for the majority of these genes are still not accepted by the FDA in, the, in different tests that are available in clinicians' offices. There's really only a handful of them that are really available clinically. And so, you know, maybe uh, Jay or Scott, you can talk about some of those ramifications that clinicians are seeing. I liked how you mentioned the clinical utility versus the personal utility. Well, let's, say, let's say it's not like a specific test, like once we start to all have our genome available and you have uh, three billion uh, sequences to sift through and then they can start to, might be able to start going through, oh, and by the way, you have this polymorphism that this study said uh, predisposes you to this, and it's not like it's a specific test or anything, but just simply giving you this, this interpretation of your genetic data that's going to start assessing risk based upon, you know, just a study here or a study there, I think. One of the um, very important laws that we deal with is HIPAA, of course, and uh, interestingly, part of the, there's a lot of, there's a lot in the HIPAA law, but one of them is the secrecy clause, and part of the idea is that um, it's not this, disclosure of information to outside entities that's forbidden. It's disclosing information to patients they didn't want to hear. So in fact, there's a lot of, there's, a, there's already a lot of regulation in place about, be, between um, GINA and HIPAA, there's a lot of regulation about what you're going to tell people because when we do genome-wide sequencing, we see everything. But when we consent, we're only consenting for a specific indication. Um, I, I think there's, um, I still think there's a lot of room for abuse, though. Yeah, I think your concern is, is one that's been raised by the primary care community. The last thing the primary care physician wants to have to do is deal with somebody bringing in their report about tests they don't know about or don't, and, and trying to have to have a conversation around that. So there's actually an interesting opinion piece in JAMA called Rating the Medical Commons, this notion that are we going to somehow distract primary care docs who are already overburdened I don't think we're seeing a lot of evidence. I mean, there's certainly anecdotal reports of patients bringing these, these in. So I don't, I don't think we see yet that we're, we're going to have that concern. It potentially could be the case down the line. But uh, I, again, I, I think it's one of these things that it's an empirical question. So I would like to see uh, us be able to, to study the potential prevalence of that as opposed to uh, assume it will or, or won't happen. But I think that is uh, a concern that, you know, can some of this, because of people's fascination, distract uh, 
from more essential components of, of their care that's going to be more relevant to their, their health outcomes. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Christy Scanlon. I'm a DDS PhD student. I had a couple of questions about the use of personalized medicine and genetic testing for minors. Um, one question I had was about the uh, psychological impact of information, if there's any study about the psychological imp impact on minors. And also, my second question is, do you think that this is an area that we may um, see in dentistry where we have to do testing like this? Um, or do you think that this is in better hands of uh, someone who's trained with genetic counseling because of the implications of trying to get consent from two parents for the minor? So I think um, I can just speak to some of the general ethical and policy considerations around testing of minors. In the medical genetics world, the idea is that uh, if it's, it depends on the, the age of onset of the condition you're testing for. So if it's adult onset condition like a Huntington's disease, the thought is that you, you allow the minor you know, to grow up to age of consent of 18 and make their own choice. And so you wouldn't want to have an interested parent testing uh, that minor because it may be unwanted information. Uh, however, obviously with newborn screening and we do have other types of, of, of genetic tests where it's actionable and only going to be effective if it's, if it's a treatment that's implemented, you know, in childhood. And so there, in those cases, we would, we would allow that type of, of testing. And I think to the extent that, you know, given that this can be complex and there are these potential psychological implications, I think uh, oftentimes it is appropriate to refer to genetics professionals who are experienced and understanding these you know, family systems dynamics who are expert in getting people to think through the implications of rather than making kind of an impulsive decision. So it's interesting that there's a, a national organization called NichePEG that its mission is to promote health professional education in genomics and it has these core competencies and one of the key competencies is knowing when to refer and so I think that is kind of knowing the limits of one's knowledge uh, is an important competency that they see for the field. This, yeah, it's kind of similar. One of the questions that uh, was submitted by one of the dental students, do you think the future of integrated patient care to promote personalized medicine will be medical visits with treatment by a group of specialists or shared information between providers through a medical database? I guess, you know, the question being, are we going to shift from it being, you know, more of a transfer of information issue versus a primary care physician model. I mean, do you see, and I guess this is more to Jay, do you see this changing kind of the way, the structure of how patients interact with their primary care provider versus other providers in their care and the communication between the providers? Yeah, that's a, that's a big topic. Uh, <laughs> the, um, yeah, I, you know, it would be a shame if the role of the primary care provider was just to collect all the saliva from everybody or, you know. Um, I have a lot of concerns that, um, there, there's a fascinating article in the New England Journal, um, it was about a year ago, I think, of um, how does a, a primary care provider spend their time in their day? And it was like 20 emails, 20 phone calls, reading 20 reports, 20 x-rays, and I think it was 32 visits or some crazy number. I mean, this, this is someone who's running 12 hours a day. And to think that, I, I don't know how they're going to be able to manage, you know, interpreting a cancer profile where there's 50 different mutations in breast cancer and everything else. So I almost wonder if there's not a new maybe it's an internal medicine, a new specialty, where medical genetics, but even m more on the, um, you know, in the area of cancer and things than we've been, where it's been mostly in pediatrics. But somebody's going to have to make this information very simple and communicate it to the providers, mm -hmm. and then they're going to have to be able to refer. I actually think it's a great time to be a genetic counselor. Um, I'm Elizabeth, and I'm a dental hygiene student. And I had a question in terms of 
Um, when it comes to future patient care and quality care, is this something that we want to do on every single patient or is this something that we want to do on specific patients because we see that they have a higher risk for this or due to their clinical parameters, they're, are, they're at this stage of periodontal disease or do we want to do it before they get to that point in terms of like treatment planning and whatnot? Yeah, so there, there could, it'll really depend on the, the clinical outcomes that have been demonstrated. Uh, and certainly these diagnostic tests could be used at many different juncture points, as we were talking about in terms of, you know, more massive screening from a public health standpoint. It, it might be, you know, an exposure of a population maybe to an infectious agent, or as you're starting to drill down a little bit deeper in, ter in terms of certain patient populations that are at higher risk. Uh, right now, it, there res really hasn't been shown to be clinical utility to do this across the board. Uh, but, you know, over time it might be in terms of, you know, if there is a, a strong ease of use uh, and, you know, really reaching out to patient populations much better because we know that, you know, ma the majority of patients don't go to see the dentist on a regular basis. There might be some of these tests that are helpful uh, and combining it with the other clinical information. Uh, but right now, there are no, none of these tests that have really been demonstrated to be that helpful for the massive screening side. I don't know if you want to speak to some of the, the other medical examples of more generalized screening. Yeah, I mean, I think there, you know, there's different purposes, but it's interesting that you know, we do have newborn screening set up you know, that's universal, for rare conditions, but usually severe ones where early intervention is important. Uh, but I'm not aware of any dental examples that would, would fit that model. But interestingly, some people have said, could that be a platform or foundation where we actually at least get whole genome sequence information? And again, the, I think the future vision is also uh, assumes this kind of development of our kind of electronic medical records uh, capabilities, but I don't, again, I don't see it being kind of widespread public health screening at, at any time soon that's immediately relevant for the kind of conditions this, this group is dealing with. I wonder if you could comment on the workforce models. I mean, certainly as this system begins to, as this system of healthcare begins to evolve, it will impact uh, workforce uh, and how who's going to deliver who's going to analyze this could any all of you comment on that I know you know we're talking about a genetics translator somebody can translate that information to the patient so they understand it but even more so I mean we're seeing this in dentistry that workforce models are emerging will this impact that this this well of course pathology should do everything but <laughs> well um, of course there's actually I think a very interesting um, this is a very interesting question because there are many for-profit companies that view their role as the future integrators of the information like GE Healthcare, uh, you know, huge companies that are investing billions. GE Healthcare uh, is planning on investing $15 billion in personalized medicine over the next five years. So I think we're going to see players that we've never seen before that view this as their space. And I think it's going to be um, a very, very dynamic time and, and we, there's a great risk that if we don't train our residents well and our faculty well and think carefully about not just the science but the business model, you know, economically how is this going to work from a policy point of view, how this is going to work, we may see a lot of it go to places that have never done this before. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Bain? Who's, who's setting the rules around the world? Are, are everybody trying to work cooperatively together or is there one or two countries that are sort of leading the way and we hope everybody gets on the bandwagon? What's that politic like? Uh. <laughs> I mean, I think the, the U.S. is probably the, the most invested and, and engaged in this. And I think you brought up earlier this idea around gene patenting. It's interesting how we do see internationally some very different ideas about gene patenting. And so it, in Europe, I think they pretty much, uh, you know, 
dismiss the idea of, for example, Myriad having a patent on the BRCA1 and 2 genetic tests. And so I think that's an example uh, where I think there are different cultural and policy norms around you know, who should own this information and is it legitimate to patent this kind of information. I think our patent system has been criticized as being too lenient in granting patents in this area. And so I think it's, that's an, an interesting, you talked about like, well, will we have to license you know, this out to all these different companies? I, I think there are different nations have very different ideas about what would be appropriate uh, for this kind of technology. There are countries like in the United Kingdom, which I don't consider their healthcare system overall to be as good as ours, but like, you know, the NICE study, they actually have a much more, I think in many ways, rational approach to um, any kind of health intervention, you know, be it colonoscopy or molecular diagnostics. I mean, they do cost effectiveness studies and they make decisions based on them uh, and then, but, but it's offered to the entire population. I think we're a lot more fragmented and there, there are a lot of wealthy people in this country that I think will probably be the ones we're gonna basically learn from initially in terms of things like genomic sequencing. I mean, we get patients who say, will you sequence my cancer genome and, you know, for $30,000? And we say, sure. <laughs> Well, I have a question for you. I was taken by the cartoon that Jay showed as his last slide with the equine medicine and, you know, all these diseases that it were diagnosed and basically the therapy was the same for all of them. And in, in periodontics, it seems, you know, notoriously we've come across the same thing in our ability to diagnose or to get diagnostic information that in the end we treat the disease the same way. And I mean, you mentioned one paradigm that could change the way we schedule our patients, but I'm wondering if you could comment on, you know, do you see this changing the way we will treat patients and what barriers or, you know, where are we going to break through on that? Yeah, in, in terms of that question, so I think the corollary could be, uh, you know, extract, extract, extract in terms of if you have a problem with a tooth that we're challenged with. And uh, certainly that's, uh, you know, it, it, it appears that the lower hanging fruit could be in the area of prevention and in terms of compliance and then those patients are going to be seeking preventive care where, you know, the intervention is basically more maintenance versus less maintenance instead of looking at those types of outcomes that are very much connected to the practitioner's skill level. And so if you look at multi-center clinical trials on outcomes related to technical placement of restorative biomaterials or, you know, regenerative products, oftentimes the practitioner skill level, especially, you know, as you look at practice-based research networks or large clinical groups, so much of what we do is really based on the clinical delivery of these different devices. Whereas, you know, in preventive care, it seems like those areas might be a bit more amenable to, you know, addressing that approach. So do you have any optimism for pharmaceutical approaches that would be tagged, you know, that would be linked to a genomic? Yeah, you know, in, in terms of the pharmaceutical, you know, in dentistry, we don't deliver a lot of uh, drugs for treatment. You know, in pain, uh, you know, the two biggest drugs in dentistry used are uh, analgesics and antibiotics. Uh, and so maybe it could be useful at some level in terms of determining, you know, which patients will metabolize with less side effects certain types of antibiotics, because oftentimes we'll grapple with that in terms of side effects with antibiotic use. And again, a very simple approach of using the pharmacogenomics in terms of, you know, using the targeting of the appropriate drug to treat the, the disease situation. It may also be the same thing for the, the analgesics and the types of patients that might respond a bit better. Question here? Jen Hu from Biologic and Material Sciences. This question is related with the ethic issue that um, referred to what Dr. Hess uh, related to earlier. Um, so, in a situation where genetic testing is prescribed, and although patients consented to specific analysis, 
that's relevant to the clinical condition. But because the uh, technique or the, the analysis used was whole genome sequencing, along the process, many uh, different DNA variants or mutations identify. They say a, a couple of them or some of them are really critical changes that uh, where early intervention may save life. So in that situation, how should that data be managed and what's the professional obligation of the individual uh, health provider who um, prescribed the tests? I have to say right now the only type of sequencing-based testing we do is for cancer and we're looking at specific cancer-causing genes and we're actually not um, reporting out in any way, you know, either analyzing or reporting out uh, the other things that we might find. Um, this is a really uh, challenging area and, and things like prenatal diagnosis because there are a lot of un, there's still a lot of unmapped variation in the genome and all. And, and um, I, I, I know colleagues who do genome-wide sequencing who find, you know, there's several hundred base pair changes we're not quite sure what they are. And, and so I think you can imagine the challenges of offering a service like that and being able to responsibly cover like what's all the implications of it. Right now, I don't really think it's possible. So we tend to just put windows on, you know, we restrict our views to what the indication is. And then, and that's very clear in when, when people are consented, that's all we're gonna do. We don't comment on these other things. I think there is certainly though an ethical and legal duty to warn if one is in possession of information that one knows could have you know, a significant impact. It was actually a legal precedent that interestingly enough came out of psychiatry. Some of you may know about the Tarasov case where uh, it was ruled that there was an obligation of, this, of the University of California to warn a patient uh, about, there was a psychiatry patient who was homicidal and ended up murdering uh, someone had disclosed this intent to the therapist, and so the, the, the case found that because this was a serious imminent threat to the person that they should have been directly warned. And so interestingly, that kind of analogy is, is used in genetic medicine as well. If the genetic information poses a serious imminent threat to the health of the, the individual, then there's an ethical and legal duty to warn. It may be that it's not possible given the type of information that's collected, but if you do have an incidental, and this applies for research as well, if you do have an incidental finding uh, of, of something like that, you would be obligated to report. However, it's very rare that we see those kinds of cases even, even come up. Okay, I think we'll uh, close now. We one more question. Oh, more. I'm sorry. sorry. Um, I'm Andy and I'm a D2. I'm Okay. Uh, okay. So, could you expand upon how personalized medicine, medicine motivates pharm pharmaceutical companies to move away from the blockbuster drugs and into more specific drugs? Yeah, you know, that's a that's a very interesting question, and it relates back to that idea that um, it, if you can have a targeted therapy, particularly like for a smaller biotech company and you can run smaller clinical trials because you can pick the patients better, you, you know, you can still do very well uh, financially and, and you can benefit, you know, a group of patients that before you might not have been able to. So I view personalized medicine as being a, extremely positive for patients with all kinds of diseases in the sense that it's more efficient to, you know, find the drugs that will work and it's more likely people develop drugs for those so-called orphan diseases. Okay, Janet. One more, one more question. So Janet Kinney from uh, Dental Hygiene. This is um, more of an observation and a, kind of an extension of a conversation that's come up in terms of companies capitalizing on genetic testing and then linking into a slide that Dr. Roberts had in terms of patients' behavior in terms of supplementing um, either to counteract or prevent um, some of these potential diseases. And then also thinking in terms of an educator and how we try to educate our students 
in terms of evidence-based decision making. So now we may have a patient come to us that's taking multiple supplements um, and just in a practical sense in the clinical setting, how, how might we deal with now educating students in terms of these complex patients, in terms of medications, supplements? Just the panel's view on that. I think, so, I mean, one simple thing is to maybe even ask uh, about this kind of use. I think sometimes it's often a revelation uh, when we're so ensconced in our medical model that we, you know, I think there have been these eye-opening surveys from the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine that have shown just the, the extent to which uh, we see use of this. And we, I think in our assessments, and I don't, I don't know what standard practice is, but in, in some specialties there's not even awareness uh, that these are being used by the patient. So I don't know if that relates to, to any of your guys' work, but I think to even have the conversation, you need to have some kind of upfront assessment about that. Yeah, I think it's valuable when we're you know, surveying the, the patient's medical history, and patients seem to be reporting more and more you know, all the different supplements that they're taking. And I'm really looking at the use of those supplements more so in, in terms of what are the direct implications to the clinical care we're going to deliver. You know, is there going to be an impact on the surgical you know, healing and those sorts of things? But also, it is helpful just to see where the patient is coming from in terms of their own disease awareness. What are they concerned about? Maybe they have some fears and why they're taking coenzyme Q to prevent gingival bleeding or some other things that have been in the media for some period of time that is maybe going to help them have a better uh, oral health and uh, you know and oftentimes these are patients just very uh, concerned about their health and just having some of that conversation. Okay so I think we'll bring this to a close but we're not going to stop here we have a reception out in the uh, entryway and I hope you will all join me in the speakers there. I also think it's interesting that you know, this is all going to be taped and can be accessed online. And I think it will be intriguing to look back at this 10 years from now and 20 years from now and see uh, how we're viewing this whole topic. So I want to thank all three speakers for really engaging presentations. Thank you. Thank you.